We just pray for the children. Lord, we pray for the, the parents this week whose sons and daughters didn't come home. Lord, I pray for that mom right now who her son's dirty clothes are still laying on the floor and she just can't bring herself to put them away. Lord, I pray your peace over those families. Your peace that passes all understanding. Through the, the hurt and the pain and the anger and the fear and all the questions of why. Holy Spirit, just come. We pray for those families. Be with them, Lord. In the powerful name of the resurrected Christ, and everyone said, amen and amen. If you have your Bible, we are going to read from the book of 2 Samuel chapter 7. 2 Samuel chapter 7 this morning, starting with verse 1. Now, <clears throat> when King David was settled in his palace and the Lord had given him rest from all his surrounding enemies, the king summoned Nathan the prophet. Look, David said, I'm living in this beautiful, beautiful cedar house, but the ark of God is out in a tent. I'm hanging with this awesome house, and God's out there camping. Something's got to change. And Nathan replied to the king, go ahead and do whatever you have in your mind, for the Lord is with you. God's with you. David, this thing that's in your heart, it's a good thing. Go ahead and do it. But, but... That same night, the Lord said to Nathan, go and tell my servant David, this is what the Lord has declared. Are you the one to build a house for me to live in? To which David would be like, that's the question I'm asking you, God. Am I the one? Should I do this thing? I have never lived in a house from the day I brought the Israelites out of Egypt to this very day, I have always moved from one place to another with a tent and a tabernacle as my dwelling. Yet, no matter where I have gone with the Israelites, I never once complained. Come on. Thank, I mean, I wish that was like that with my kids. I wish you just never complained, kids. When are we going to be there? Like, just never complain. God said, listen, never once have I complained to the Israelites, to their leaders, to the shepherds of my people of Israel. I have never asked them, why have you built me this beautiful cedar house? Now go and say this to my servant David. This is what the Lord of heaven's armies has declared. I took you from tending sheep in a pasture and selected you to be the leader of my people of Israel. I have been with you wherever you have gone, and I have destroyed all your enemies right before your eyes. Now I will make your name as famous as anyone who has ever lived on earth. And I will provide a homeland for my people Israel, planting them in a secure place where they will never be disturbed. Evil nations won't oppress them as they've done in the past." Starting from, this time I, starting from the time that I appointed judges to rule my people Israel, I will give you rest from all of your enemies. Furthermore, I, the Lord, declare that, uh, that he will make you a house for you, a dynasty of kings. Wait, hold on. Like David wants to build a house for God, but God said, no, no, I'm going to build a house for you. A dynasty of of kings. For when you die and are buried with your ancestors, I will raise up one of your descendants, your own offspring, and I will make his kingdom strong. He is the one who will build my house, a temple for my name, and I will secure his royal throne forever, and I will be his father, and he will be my son. And if he sins, I will correct and I'll discipline him with the rod like any father would do. But my favor my favor will not be taken from him as I took it from Saul, whom I removed from your sight. Your house and your kingdom will continue before me for all times, and your throne will be secure forever. 
And so David went back. So Nathan went back to David and told him everything that the Lord had said in this vision. So a few things, a little disclaimer first before we get into this passage of scripture. Um, a lot of times uh, when I give you a sermon, I try to lay out this buffet, right? It's just, man, you could pick and you could grab some things and, oh, that was just for me. Uh, but this isn't one of those sermons. This is one of those sermons that you've got to take it in, in its entirety. If you try to take just a little piece of it, you're going to get off, off balance. You, you, you got to get the whole thing this morning. Um, and, and apply the whole thing, because if you take just a piece, you're going to miss it. Um, this world, like, it, it's just it's so quick, it's so fast. We love things to be bite-sized. We love things like in tweets. If you could just give me a tweet, and I could read this in like five seconds and move on. Um, we, I, I, I have this thing on my phone where I can listen to podcast, and the button says you can listen to it at one and a half speed, or twice the speed to listen to it even faster. So if it's like a five hour book, I could do it in two and a half hours. And the people talk real fast, they talk like this, and you talk like this. And, like, and uh, ooh, you know, I could, I could do so much quicker. And, and it, the book that I was listening to was called The Ruthless Elimination of Hurry <laughs> at two times the speed. No, 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 like you can't. Some things you have to slow down. They actually make these books now where you could purchase, it's called the summary of a book. In a 200-page book, you could read the book in 25 pages. But can you? Should you? Do we want to live in that type of world where everything's just quick? I heard a story the other day. My buddy Gary is in the house, and uh, he had gone over to my friend Tommy. Tommy's here somewhere. Where's Tommy at? He's out in the hall. He doesn't like to, he's here. Where's, where's Tommy? Right there, Tommy. So Tommy's cooking for Gary, and apparently Tommy didn't cook his steak quite as well as Gary would have liked, which everyone knows you eat steak medium rare. That's just the standard of, uh, that's how you're supposed to eat steak. Uh, but Gary's weird. And <laughs> Tommy's like, you know, I could cook it a little more for you. I don't want to, but I'll cook it a little more. Gary's like, no, no, no. He takes the steak and pops it in the microwave. That's almost grounds for excommunication. <laughs> like, seriously, there's just certain things. Like, can you cook it in the microwave? Yes. But should you? No, Gary. <laughs> I'm telling you, don't do that. Don't be like Gary. That's what you should get from the sermon today. Slow down. Don't listen to two times speed. Take this thing as a whole. So we have this moment. And when it comes to, to just hearing the voice of God, um, this is just a question that will come up at some point in every one of our Christian walk. I'm just like, I want to hear God's voice. I want to know what he's saying. And I just, I just want it to be clear. And when we open up the scriptures, we see all of these examples of God speaking. And sometimes when God speaks, I mean, it is just crystal clear. I mean, have you looked whatever God is telling, hey, this is what I want my tabernacle to look like. I mean, God has given them dimensions, and I want it to be 17 by 50, and I want you to use this color, and I want you to use goat skins. And I, want to, I mean, God is very clear. And I'm just, I read that, and I say, God, why don't you just talk to me like that? It would be so, could you just send me a text? Just boom, you know? And God's never talked to me like that. And, and I've never once in my entire life heard the audible voice of God. I think the closest I've ever heard to the audible voices of God was uh, James Earl Jones when he read the Bible. Like, that was pretty close. That, that was it. But I've never, I've never and, and sometimes I read the scriptures, and I'm like, God, if you could just speak to me like this. And, and, and for me, uh, God's not GPS. He doesn't give me turn-by-turn -turn directions. It's more of a compass where this way is north, and you're just going to start walking and finding your way. And one of the, the big things that we quote often, Jeremiah 29, 11, for I know the plans I have for you, plans to, for a hope and a future. And you realize he's writing that to a people who have been hauled away into captivity. Okay, God, what are those plans? What is that hope? 
Is there anyone with me this morning that, come on, God, if you could just make it clear what, what exactly, I have these things in my heart, but I'm not sure, and you're trying to hear God's voice. You're trying to understand his will. And if you grew up in the church, uh, there was this period of time, probably in the 90s, maybe, late 90s-ish, where it was a big thing teaching on the will of God. What is the will of God for your life? And then people would start talking about uh, the perfect will of God, the permissive will of God, and all these things about the will. And, and you heard it, and you acted like you understood, but no one had a clue what the, te- the teacher was talking about. You know, like, you, you just don't know. You're just like, I'm trying to get it, but I'm not understanding it. And then you open up the scriptures, and I relate to Paul where there's time after time where he says, listen, it seemed like a good thing. I'm not exactly sure. God didn't tell me exactly that I should do this, but it seemed good. And then I look at the apostle's life, and there's times where even he says this seemed like a good thing, but then you see the unraveling of the story, and it doesn't look like it unravels very good. I mean, the brother gets stoned, left for dead, shipwrecked, bitten by snakes. All of these things happen. And at the time, you're thinking, well, God, it seemed good to do this. And I stepped out in faith. But all of this happened. Is it really good? And then God begins to work. And then you see, oh, all of these things that were meant for evil begin to turn good. And so maybe it was really good. And and then you're confused because, well, what if? I would have stayed or what if I would have went or should I have made this decision or that decision? But ultimately, he works all things for the good. And so even if it seems, God, what are you saying? And David is in this point in time because he wants to build God a house. It's, he, he looks around and there's rest on every side and all this has happened and, and he's done these things and God, I'm living in this beautiful cedar palace and you're out camping in my backyard. God, I wanna build you this house. I want to do this thing for you. Should I be the one? And God isn't telling him. And so David goes to Nathan. He goes to the prophet and he, he just, yeah, I, I'm trying to see God. I'm wondering like, should I build this place for God? And to which Nathan goes and says, yeah. Do it. God is with you. It's in your heart. God's with you. Go ahead and do it. He takes it to God. He takes it to the the prophet. Should I do this good? And to which the answer is yes. Should we do good things? Yeah. Yeah, we should. You should do good things. Should I help my neighbor? Should I take this missions trip? Yes. I mean, I think we forget sometimes that Jesus said, listen, go into all the world. Go into the, and we're worried like, well, should I go? Yes. I am your pastor and I'm telling you, that's what it says. Yes. We should go. We should do these things. Is there something on your heart? Should I start this ministry for the poor? Yes. Should I go and should I preach the gospel to every, yes. But at some point, what happens is for some of us, we come so paralyzed by fear that we might do the wrong thing that ultimately we do nothing. Ultimately, we're so like, well, should I do this? Well, I don't know. God hasn't quite said yet, so I, I'll just stand here. And then we try to cover it up with all this Christian language of, well, I'm just waiting. When the truth is, you're afraid. And I know you can't say amen right there, but you've been there. And you're just, God, should I do this? And should I go? Should I do this? And for some of us, there's this idea that, well, God is this kind of dictator in the sky. That the second you mess up, that God's going to be right there to just boom and put you back in line. God is just, no, I'm just, I'm just waiting for you to mess up, Carl. The second you mess up. And so, so we're just paralyzed by this fear. Um, this uh, past season, uh, my uh, oldest daughter, Kobe, she wanted to do soccer. And I know nothing about soccer, uh, but I'm getting out there, and there was a time where the coach couldn't make the practice, so the coach said, hey, Lucas, could you just handle practice? And I said, sure. Well, not a problem. Do I know anything about soccer? Not a thing, but they're going to have fun. And uh, we get out there, and we're doing this, and then some of the kids are saying, well, what position do I play? What position should I play? And I said this, well, why don't we just start playing and we'll see what position you're supposed to play. Because you you don't know if you're a good goalie yet or not. You've never even played the game, Kobe. 
You, you, don't, you don't know if you want to be a forward or what? I don't even know. Are there forwards in soccer? Yeah. So the, the person on the right side of the field, you know? And uh, but, but let's just start playing in the game and let's just see where you excel. Let's just see where you want to be. And I think sometimes it's the same thing with church, right? I mean, somebody like, oh, I don't know. Where, where should I volunteer? Where should I serve? How about you just start serving somewhere and we see where you fit? And, and you thought like, oh, man, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to serve with the kids' ministry. But the kids don't like you, <laughs> you know? So we're going to move you somewhere else, right? Oh, Pastor Lucas, I think I'll make a good greeter. You ain't smiled in seven years. We're going to put you somewhere else. You know what I'm saying? But we're going to get you moving. We're going to start. It's, it's so much easier to steer a car that's moving than one that's parked. Right? But we have this fear of, all right, God, I'm in the car. I'm ready to go. Do I go left or do I go right? Just start going to a land that I will show you. Just start moving, Abraham. When you just start moving, I'll start directing you north, north by northeast. Okay, now we'll, we'll get it dialed in. Don't worry about it. I'm here to tell you this morning that God is a green light. Amen. God is a green light. See, some of us, I think, have approached God as he's a red light, and we're waiting for him to go green. That's not the case. God is a green light. He is a green light God saying, no, no, green light, go into all the nations, Go on, preach all God. I know you don't think you're ready, Peter. I know you don't think you're ready, Paul. I know you don't think you're ready, but you know what? You're going to be as you go. I'm sending you out. I'm sending you out two by two, and you're going to go, and you're going to cast out demons, and you're going to do all of these things. Do it. Go. He's a green light. Should I go? Yes. Yes, you should. And somewhere I think we flipped it around to where God is this red light God. And God, I think, even uh, approaches this in the book of Matthew, chapter 25, where he tells the story of these servants. And he takes them aside and he says, listen, I'm going to give you five talents. I'm going to give you two talents. I'm going to give you one talent. And he goes off, and, and the guy with five talents does really well and brings, hey, look, I took your five, and now I made ten, and I took your two, and I made it four. And then this one guy comes up, and he says, listen, and I want you to hear the words that this servant says about his master. Master, I knew you to be a hard man, reaping where you did not sow and gathering where you scattered no seed. So I took it, and I hid it in the ground, and I'm bringing it back to you. Everything he just said was completely false. I knew you to be a hard man. He's not a hard man at all. He is a generous man. He gave you the talent. He gave one five, and he gave one two, and he gave one one. He is a generous, and he is a good master. But you saw him as one where he, he well, he, he reaped where he didn't even plant it. What you didn't realize is you were the seed. You were the seed. You only think he reaps where he didn't plant it. But he planted all of this. Even before you saw it, he was working when you, did, when you were napping. So he has this idea of who the master is, and none of it's correct. He's this hard man, and he's reaping where he didn't sow, and he's gathering where he scattered no seeds. And like, what are you doing? And he thinks he's doing a good job because he hasn't robbed from him. Because, well, after all, we got to the end of this journey, and I gave you back what was yours. And I'm here to tell you this morning, church, like when we stand before Christ on that day, he wants a return on his investment. And that investment is you. He's giving you talents. Some of us he's given five, some he's given four, some he's given one. But the one thing you can't do with your life is bury it in the sand. The one thing you can't do is get to the end of this life and say, well, God, at least I didn't do this. It doesn't count. You've got, you've got to make the most of it. It doesn't matter if you've got five or if you've got one. I think I'm a one talent person. On my best days, too, I, I can tell a pretty good story, and I'm willing to be a fool. God, for you. And I take those two, and I turn it into four, and I turn it into eight. And sometimes I lose it all, and I start again, and I turn it into two, and I turn it into four. But the one thing, when I stand before God, I'm not going to say I buried it in the sand. And neither should you. And this is the type of church that we need to be, that goes and I don't know, there's good in my heart. There's things I want to do, and you need to go to God is a green light. He's not angry at you. He's not just trying to hurt you every time something goes wrong. 
See, the very thing that we believe is keeping us comfortable in God's grace is the very thing that's keeping you from your destiny. Because I, I, I haven't done all of the, and I just, well, I just buried it in the sand and now I'm bringing it back to you. Like, no, no, no. It's keeping you from your destiny. You were supposed to take that talent and do something with it. At, at least, he said, yeah, at least you could have put it in the bank and got me some interest on it. That point zero zero five percent that they give you at bb and like, He said, at least do that. At least do that. You are the seed. I'm here to tell you this morning that it's a go until it's a no. It's a go until it's a no. See, God is this green light. Even Nathan sees it. God, he sees the hand of God on David's heart. He's like, you know, God is with you. He's in your heart. This is a good thing that you desire to do. Just go ahead. And David starts making plans. All right, I'm going to build this thing. But that night, the Lord spoke. And you know what? I'm going to give you a no. See, the Lord will stop you. If there's, there's something, you know, there's, there's something good that's in your heart, the Lord will stop you when it's time to stop. And there's a few things that I just, I want to catch you this because it's, it's hearing the voice of God. It's following this direction. You know, David has seeked after God, in which that's what we do. We seek after God. We want to hear your voice. We want to know what you're saying. What are you calling us to do? Those plans and those purposes that you have for us. And sometimes it's unclear. And with David, it's unclear. So the next thing he does, he gets some wisdom. He, he talks to the prophet. He talks to Nathan. We, we, when there's times and we're see, thinking about, I, I, I want to do this, and, and we're not exactly sure, God, are you saying I can do this or not? And, and you're not, seek some wisdom. Talk to the elders. Talk to people that you respect. Talk to people that you know are following Jesus with all of their heart. Talk to, to some of the people that you're, you're serving with on your teams. And so, just, what do you think? Get, get some wisdom. Get some wisdom behind you. And then it, does, it says this. It says, it was a time where the Lord had given him rest on his surround, from his surroundings, from all of his enemies, from all these wars that he had fought. In other words, this, before David goes on to do the next thing, he finished the last thing. He had done all of these things that God had told him to do. And he finds himself in this place of rest of, okay, now God. You can't do the next thing until you've done the last thing. See, we want to be disobedient with something that God has told us, and we think, well, well, I could just not do that, and we'll just skip over, and God really doesn't care. No, it doesn't work that way. You've got to do the last thing. I know you want to start, like, a mission in Africa, and you want to help the homeless, and you want, like, how about your neighbor? How about God told you to go next door? How about we just start there? How about we just start with that one talent that God put in you, and we'll just will feed that one hungry person that you know is right down the street. Amen. See, sometimes I think we have this, these visions, this dream, it's gonna be so big. It's gonna... But if you ain't faithful with a little, if you ain't faithful with that one talent, you ain't never gonna be faithful with two talents. And if you ain't faithful with those five talents, you're never gonna be faithful with 10 talents. I know that's hard to hear, but man, that's the word of the Lord this morning. So we, we live in this time, we just want all of this, but man, it's, it's, it's glory upon glory, and God ain't gonna bless the next thing until you've done the last thing. I remember when we started this church, uh, I jokingly say, uh, Chris will tell you, we had two big contributors to the church, uh, Visa and MasterCard, and uh, we just went out, me and Chris got a couple credit cards, and we racked up like 30 grand on these credit cards, and we're like, we're gonna give it our best shot, or we're gonna... <laughs> working for the next couple of years to pay this thing off. And uh, the church had it paid off in, it was like less than six months, I believe. And then some time went on. And then instead of 30 grand, we needed 300 grand. And then some time went on. And instead of 300 grand, we need 3 million. And I just, I was looking at the, the phase of our church life of just like, okay, God, but we were faithful with the 30 grand. And we're faithful with the 300 grand. Let us be faithful with the 3 million too. Each step upon it. Because if it's for us, then I want it. And I want to be faithful with whatever you give us, God. And if we're faithful with a little, we'll be faithful with much. And I look at David's life, and his whole life is about that. He said, I've, I've plucked you from the field. And he was faithful with just these sheep when the bear came. And he was faithful when the lion came. 
And then he was faithful when there was a Goliath. And then he was faithful when there was a whole nation of Philistines against him. Each step of the process, God's moving him. See, sometimes we like to think of people as overnight successes or overnight failures. It doesn't work that way. It's step upon step. It's a daily obedience. It's a long obedience in the same direction. It's a daily taking our talent and saying, I'm not gonna bury this thing today. The good that's in our heart, let's, let's do this. And then it says this, that there was rest on every side. See, I think this is an important key too when we're trying to do things for God. I think our greatest work will come from a place of rest. Your greatest work won't come from a place where you're stressed out and worried and like, should I do this or should I do this? Like, and like, get to a place where you're at rest and you're at peace in God. Okay, God, and now we're gonna take that next step. Now we're gonna take that next step. Because if you're shaking over here, you're really gonna be shaking over here. Because it's a process. If the bear scared you, the lion's gonna scare you more. If the lion scared you, you wait till you see Goliath. So each step, and from this place of rest, David just shows us this. Each step, a man after God's own heart, each time this place of rest, even to the point where he gets run out of the kingdom, it's okay. I'll go back to this cave. I've been there before. And God brings them back, and it's okay. I've been here before too. I've learned this secret, to be content in all things, whether to abase or to bound, to have little or to have much, to have a full belly, to have an empty belly. I could do all things through Christ who strengthens me. You need to go until you get a no. There's something in your heart to do good. Do good. God will stop you if it's not for you. And when he does, watch this. So there's this word that David has come from God. It's in his heart. He wants to build God this house. And, and God responds by saying, you ain't, you're not the one. I know it's in your heart. I know you want to do this. And I'm a go, but now you've got to know. Watch how David responds. Who am I, O oh sovereign Lord? Well, what, is, what is my family that you've brought me even this far? Sovereign Lord, in addition to everything else, you speak of giving me an everlasting dynasty. Do you deal with everyone this way? What more can I say to you? You know because your servant, what, 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 what he's really like. Because of your promise and according to your will, you have done all of these great things and have made them known to your servant. Oh, how great you are, O oh sovereign Lord. Are you catching this? How do you respond when someone tells you no? Do you, do you hear the thanksgiving in his voice? I don't know, but when somebody tells me no, I start complaining. What do you mean no? No, no, no. I got the means. We got the time. We could do this. I, I, I'm the king. We can make sure that this happens and we can build it. What, what do you mean no? What do you mean no, Devin? Come on, girl. I'm the man of the house. You tell me no? How do you respond when people tell you no? This is like, this is a side nugget for everybody. This is leadership 101. You want to know what's really in somebody's heart? Just tell them no. It don't matter what it's about. It could be anything. Just tell them no and watch how they respond. Look at how David responds. The thanksgiving and the praise. Oh God, thank you for this. Well, what other nations, O oh God, have you redeemed from slavery to be your own people? You made a great name for yourself when you redeemed your people from Egypt. And like David's just seeing this, this big picture you've promised and all these promises you have concerning me and my family. You've said this, O oh God, I will build you a, a house for you, a dynasty of kings. Do you see the flip that's taking place? I wanted to build you a house, but God, now you're telling you, you're going to build me a house. And not only are you going to build me a house, you're going to make this a dynasty of kings where my family and my children and my children's children, and this is going to go on forevermore, a everlasting blessing. See, sometimes I think we have it in our heart. We want to do something for God. And, and let, me, let me tell you guys, uh, this is in my heart. I, I want to do something for God. I want to do something. I want to take this life, and I want to take whatever talent God has given me, and I want to do something for him with it. I, I want to do something with my life for Jesus. I, I, I mean, I, I've devoted my life to, like, I want to build this community. I, I want to be a part of answering Jesus' prayer that we would all be one. 
just as him and the Father are one. I desire and I pray for it daily that there be unity in the body and somehow I could play a role with that. And I desire and I pray for it daily for you. And I say, God, you've called us to make disciples and, and I want to see disciples that are just rooted, just strong in you. I want to see every man and woman in this room right now just so deep with Christ that when things get tough and they will get tough, you don't give up. I'm tired of seeing people give up. Like, God, I want to do this. I want to do all of this for you. And let me be honest. Like, when I play, I play to win. I'm not going to, like, it doesn't matter if it's a board game or we're just playing. I'm going to try to smoke you. I mean, that's just, that's just the way I am. This is part of me. I, I remember one time, this is, not, this is multiple times, uh, me and Alan, um, we went to school together. We've been buddies for a long time. And we we'd often play poker together. Uh, the problem with me and Alan playing poker is we are both like the exact same skill level of poker player. And so it doesn't matter who we would play with. Alan will tell you, we'd have a group of people, you know, it'd be five people, 10 people. Uh, our wives would try to play, his dad would like, and, and, and we'd play poker and we'd beat everybody. And it'd be me and Alan. And hours would go by. And we're like, we hate this game. Will you just give up, Alan? Lucas, we just get, neither one of us would give up because it's just in us. And we'd be going all in just trying to like bluff and stuff. And, but it's just in us. Like, no, no, no. We're going to play this thing through. It'd be two o'clock in the morning because we're just not going to quit. And I'm telling you, I want that same thing in you. Like we talk about, oh, things are so tough. Guys, let me be honest with you. We, ha we haven't seen tough yet. We complain about gas prices. <laughs> like, come on. We haven't even seen tough yet. We've got to have some deep roots in our faith that God, no weapon formed against me is going to prosper. No matter what happens, no matter what comes against me, it, even if it seems good and we end up shipwrecked and we end up beaten and we end up stoned and we end up left for dead, I'm not giving up on you, Jesus. That kind of faith and we just want to do something for God. And I read this and I realize it's not so much what we want to do for God, but it's what he wants to do for us. See, I want to build him this house. But what he says is, Lucas, what you don't understand is, I want to build you a house. I'm already taken care of. When have I ever complained? Is, is the whole world not in my hands? Do I, do, is there anything that takes me by surprise? See, the thing I want to do for you is everlasting and everlasting. It's gonna be for your children, David, and, and your children after that and generations after that. God wants to do something for you. What's your next step? What's your next step? Have you been seeking God? And I'm gonna ask the worship team to come back up. Have you been seeking God? God, should I do this thing? Have you been seeking counsel? Should we go? The answer is yeah. You should go until there's a no. Go until there's a no. And here's what's even more amazing. When God does tell you no, when he does tell you no, it leads to an even bigger yes. It leads to an even bigger yes. Come on, somebody. I knew you thought God would just do this. I knew you thought, hey, oh, he would just do this. He would just build this house. But God said, I'm not only going to build that house. I'm going to be a house upon a house upon a house upon generation upon generation. As a matter of fact, from your bloodline is going to come Jesus. All of these things. So you just thought this one thing, but I'm looking at the big picture. I'm looking at this eternal picture. I know the plans I have for you. I know you don't see them all right now, but if you just trust and put your life in my hands, there's a hope. It may feel like you're surrounded. I'm asking everyone to stand to their feet. It may feel like you're going through it lately. It may feel like there's heartache and pain and hurt. And in the midst of it, sometimes hope can be scary. But God is enlarging David's vision. I took you from the field and I made you king. Just for this moment, just close your eyes for a minute. And I know you're not where you want to be.
But let me remind you, you're not where you were. I, I know you, there's some people in the room right now, you thought you'd be further along in life. You thought this would have happened by now, and it just hasn't happened. And it feels like there's been some no's. But in this moment, just allow the Lord to, to broaden your vision. He's taking you from a field. David asked the question, do you treat all your kids like this? I'm here to tell you the morning, this morning, the answer is yes. He does. You may not be king, but the thing that he has for you is the best thing for you. Oh, even to be a servant in the house of the Lord. I've plucked you from the field. Someone just needs to hear that this morning. I've plucked you from the field when no one knew your name, when your own family forgot about you. I'm not done with you yet. I know it's in your heart. I know you wanna do great things. But here's the thing, just, just rest in me and let me do something great in you. Christ in you, the hope of glory. Come, Lord Jesus. Come, Lord Jesus, to hear your voice, to follow your guidance, to move with you to the left, to the right. Where you go, we go. If you stop, we stop. In you, we live and breathe and move and have our very being. I wanna build you a house, but I lay down the hammer. Come, Lord Jesus. If you're in the room this morning and you don't know him, may today be the day of your salvation. The Father is calling you home, my son, my daughter. I love you. All things have passed away. My love is the same yesterday, today, forever. Just come home. Take a minute. Let's just thank him this morning. God, we just thank you. Lord, we thank you for the no's. We thank you, Lord, for keeping us, Lord. We thank you for all those things that we could have made a really bad decision, but God, you held us in your arms. We thank you. We praise you. We give you all the glory. We give you all of the honor. Oh, we just thank you. You're good. You're good. You've been so, so good to us, God. You know, every Sunday when we close the message, I say three little words, grace and peace. And, 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 and somebody asks, you know, you know why, why, would, why do you say that every time? You know, there's a few, there's a bunch of reasons. Uh, the Apostle Paul does it in his, his letters quite often. I just thought it was pretty cool. But when I say those words, I hope you understand what they really mean. When I say that word grace over your life, that word grace that empowers you to do everything that God has called you to do. That grace that says, you know what? God, we're not enough. And we have failed miserably, but God, you are. That grace that I just, I need more and more of it every single day. And that peace that peace as we move into a world that just it wants to listen to everything at two times speed. Just give me your peace, God, to slow down, 
to find you in the midst of this, to hear your voice. You want to hear his voice? Turn down the noise. Like I've, I found that to be so true about God. He doesn't like to yell over anybody. Just turn down the noise in your life. Get some solitude. Get to a place where there's rest on every side. It might be walking in the beach at 6 a.m. It ain't gonna be walking on the beach today at one. I'll tell you what, if you're here and you're a tourist, we love you. We give you Memorial Weekend and Labor Day weekend. But y'all know what I'm saying? Listen, grace and peace over your life. Grace and peace over your marriage. Grace and peace over your kids. Grace and peace over your family. Grace, peace over your health. Grace, peace over your daughters. Grace and peace over your sons. Grace and peace in the powerful name of the resurrected Christ. And everyone said amen and amen. We will see you next Sunday. Grace and peace.